All right, everyone. Any problems before we move on? Okay. Good. So you learned a very important lesson. Most of what we do in neuroimaging analysis is deep fucking stuff. You spent quite a bit of time doing this. But this is good. And especially if you're new to Unix, these are very important skills to know. You know, SSH, it's not a very simple tool doing all that copying either. But we are going to move on. Um, I'll be talking for a little bit about what these preprocessing steps do. I'll be demonstrating a little, th a little bit on my computer, and then you'll have some time to do practice on your own. And lunch is at 12.15. Is that what we're... Whenever you're done. Schedule four. Whenever you're done. <laughs> In that case, we're, uh, we're, we're done right now. So, no, um, we'll try to be done around 12.15, if not, if not a little bit earlier. So um, I also had the Apne viewer as a separate topic. It's really going to be folded into this, so it's going to be kind of seamlessly blended into that. There's no separate set of slides for that. So we'll be learning about it as we're doing all these different pre-processing steps. Right. So I alluded to this earlier these different pre-processing steps. I'm going to show you uh, some <coughs> illustrations and animations where appropriate about what these different things do. We'll then map these onto specific AFNI commands. We'll do a couple and then we'll uh, look at and run one of the scripts to do all the pre-processing for a single subject. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. So these are the steps. So I'm not going to Say them all again, but this is typically what's done. Sometimes, sometimes people omit certain steps. Sometimes they introduce other steps. <clears throat> I don't think Apne does bandpass filtering anymore. They sometimes do it, sometimes don't with no releases. Um, smoothing, which we'll, ta we'll, we'll talk about today, but also tomorrow we'll talk about why with MVPA analysis some people recommend excluding that step. So all these things will affect your data somehow. The entire goal of pre-processing is to try to clean up the data as much as we can before we actually do anything with it, before we model anything. Like I said, fMRI data is very noisy and when we're taking a snapshot of every volume of the brain, it's, it's just like we're taking an actual picture with a camera, right? But there could be distortions, there could be red eye, uh, it could be something in the, somebody in the photo you don't want to be there. You want to kind of like edit that out. Uh, it could be blurry because the person was moving when, when you took the, the picture. All those same things apply. We're just trying to clean it up as best as possible. We're trying to get it in a format that can be understood uh, across anybody doing any kind of study so that you know, same dimensions, uh, same size, same template, same everything. That's really the purpose of all of this. Okay, so let's walk through each of those different steps. The first one, pretty simple, we determine whether to remove certain TRs. Uh, TR stands for repetition time. Obviously, TR, repetition time. <laughs> right? Time to repetition, I think, is what was originally. They didn't want to use RT because that traditionally stands for reaction time. But TR is also used to refer to uh, each volume acquisition that you get. Okay? They call these volumes, they call these acquisitions. But with scanners, these first a few, could be three up to five volumes that they acquire for reasons about physics not totally understood to me. The ones at the very beginning with the scanners first taking its first uh, scans, first images, are going to have overall global mean signal that's a lot higher than the rest of the scans in the sequence. We typically discard these Right? Because they're so different, we just treat them as essentially noise, and we don't include them with the rest of the analysis. I do want to say one thing, and, and Bob Cox has talked a lot about this, the, the developer happened. These first couple actually have better contrast right, between gray matter, white matter, ventricles, all of that. But what he recommends doing is keeping one or two of these to use as an intermediary in the registration step. It's a little bit more advanced. I'm just letting you know that it's not always uh, junk that you just want to remove. But typically, we do remove it. You can remove these with a command called 3dtcat, which we'll, we'll see in a moment. Also, 
what's done these days, usually you never need to worry about this because scanners will automatically run through a few of these first initial volumes, and then they only start the experiment after there's been this saturation. Right, so if the experiment starts where that orange line is, you, you basically don't even see these. These aren't output to you. So for a lot of people, they don't even think about this step. It's, it's irrelevant. But in case you do have them, you do need to be aware of it. You need to know uh, how many you're going to discard. I would say you know, five is typically a safe bet. And there are ways to check for whether you need to remove them or not, which we will do. Depending on sampling rate, right? It could depend on sampling rate, yeah. Yeah, so if you, so the TR, it could be, uh, with very fast scanners, let's say multi band it could be a second or less. Um, I've done an experiment where our TR was three seconds. In that case, maybe we just need two or three scanners before we reach saturation. Yeah, if your sampling rate is very quick, you need to adjust for that. So let's say about 10 seconds before you actually start the experiment. Okay, next one is to check skull stripping. This is always a fun step. Notice that most of the, so the data on Open Neuro, they have this face removal uh, algorithm called, I think, pi to face, just to, to anonymize the data. But beyond that, we also try to strip, st listen to me, strip the skull and all the surrounding non-brain area. So after we do this, it's an important check to make sure it didn't strip too much and also that it didn't strip too little. The, the, the main part of this, the main reason why we do this is to try to improve registration because our T2 weighted images or functional images or epi images, I'm using all those terms interchangeably, T2, functional, epi, uh, usually you don't see a lot of this non-brain. Area. So we just remove all the skull, all the nine brain stuff from both the T1 anatomical and the T2 images to give them a better chance of aligning successfully. Now in this example, there is a little bit of skull remaining after the skull stripping is done. Is that a problem? Cases like that, I would say no. This is a judgment call. Um, usually something like that doesn't throw it off too much. And there's really no perfect skull stripping that I've seen. So usually if it's good enough and I'm not actually removing any parts of the brain, I'm happy with that. Um, I haven't ever really needed to change the defaults in AFNI. I have changed parameters in FSL skull stripping before, but with AFNI it usually does a good job, but we are going to check it anyway, just to give you a sense for what that step should look like. So a little bit of skull, usually I don't care about that. I do care if it's actually removing large parts of the brain. Okay, slice time and correction. When we're collecting a single image, we're actually collecting each slice, right? So we're not collecting everything instantaneously. What's actually happening, sometimes we collect them every other slice, and then we fill in all the gaps in the next run or we acquire them sequentially going up or sequentially going down. Now, if this is the first slice at the very bottom, the last slice is up at the top, the time it takes to traverse that entire distance is one TR to get the entire volume. So in reality, we collect all of them uh, sequentially, but slice time corrected acts as though they're all collected at the same time. Now, some people prefer not to do it because they don't like adding in this additional interpolation step. And also, if you have a very quick acquisition rate, let's say TR2 seconds or shorter, it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference to your data. And you can also account for any differences in the timing acquisition of one slice to the other by using something called a temporal derivative in your model. So some people prefer that just to model it out of the data instead of actually affecting the raw data. In all of our pre-processing steps, there's this, this tension between uh, altering the raw data and trying to clean it up. Right? So anytime we try to clean it up, we do introduce these interpolations. We do affect it to some degree. Um, so I time and correction, you know, that did go kind of quick. I just want to make sure something is clear here. Uh, let's see. 
So when I said, you know, reality, they're all acquired, at, you know, slight offsets. So I said, correction acts as though they're all acquired at the same time, which means that the ones that are acquired later, it's almost as though, you know, you sample this at a, a slightly later time, it's going to push that back in time. So this last one may have occurred two seconds after this one, but it takes that, all the data in that slice, and moves it back, say, two TRs. This one back, you know, 1.8 TRs or whatever the, the fraction was to get there, right? So that's what's going on. So it does uh, disturb the data a little bit. The, the reason why people, you know, want to do it in the first place is because they want to act as though uh, each acquisition happened when uh, we said it happened in our onsets, right? Because our onsets are for, um, basically, we, we can't model each slice separately. You could, but that would be very computationally intensive. So we prefer to simplify things a little bit and act as though everything was acquired at the same time. These days, you know, my sense is that people usually, uh, usually don't use it. Um, in our scripts, we will. Just, uh, and, you know, as an exercise, if you want to, near the end of the day, you can do it with and without, see if it makes a difference. In my experience, it really doesn't make that big of a difference. So whichever way you prefer to do it, I don't really think it matters too much. If I had a TR of, say, three seconds, that would be a little bit different. I might then uh, consider doing it. But with acquisition rates being what they are, usually it's kind of a wash whether you do it or not. So it's just because each slice is being acquired like only milliseconds away from one another? Right. So it's not yeah. Okay. yeah, you get a TR of 0.8 seconds. Yeah. Would it really make that big of a difference because, you know, this... this HRF unfolds over a pretty long time period. Probably, probably not. There's there's some back and forth. I haven't I've really glossed this over, but there's been a back and forth between Carl Frist and some other people about the merits of either doing it or not doing it. I'm just saying, from my personal experience, I haven't found that big of a difference doing it one way or the other. But just be aware of it and be aware of uh, what it actually does. Motion correction and whatnot, notwithstanding, if you have a Okay, so if they're moving a lot, would I recommend not doing it? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I would probably not do it in that case. So the, the reasons, so the reasons are that there could be these interactions between motion and slice time and correction. So if they're moving when a volume is being acquired, which is basically all the time, and these motions are pretty severe, who knows what kind of interactions are happening between, you know, shifting uh, the actual timing of you know, when you assume the slice is acquired and what the motion is introducing in terms of signal changes, which we'll see on the next slide. Yeah. Well, all these things are interrelated. And to make you even more discouraged, I'm sorry, <laughs> but there's a, there's a preprint that just came out maybe a couple weeks ago by Martin Lindquist and colleagues uh, showing that a lot of these pre-processing steps that I'm talking about, they're not uh, orthogonal. Right? So they, they, they do share some variance. They do share some correlation with each other. And what they, what they claim to have shown, again, not published yet, is that uh, a, a later pre-processing step can actually introduce artifacts that were supposedly taken out by a previous pre-processing step. And they've shown that that can happen in some cases. And so they recommend including everything in one single model. So that all those those uh, that that variance that's being shared is accounted for at the same time. Yeah, so these steps can all be done. Do you, is it recommended to do it all with, within like each and all of us? That's more what they're recommending. I, I don't want to give any recommendations now because it hasn't been peer reviewed. <laughs> but if if this is in fact true, this this could affect the way that we do business. Unfortunately. Um, I should have just not even said anything. <laughs> I'm trying to keep us focused, right? Don't want to get too far off the path. Uh, motion correction is a pretty simple concept. Because people will move in the scanner, just it's uh, a fact of life. Um, 
you know, minuscule motions are not that big of a deal, but if they do move by if they do move by any significant amount, we can try to track that amount of motion from uh, scan to scan, from volume to volume. Let's say they moved one millimeter to the right. Okay, all we do with motion correction, if we know that, is to simply reverse that process. So bring it back to where it was before. And what you use as a reference, it, it depends. I mean, bless you. Some people use just the first volume of the entire run. I mean, you know, why not? You got to choose some reference. Some people take uh, an average. Um, I think the default in the app needs to take the very first volume, use that as a reference. And once you do this, you get this output. This is, uh, the, this, this shows you what the motion was like in both the in translations, so the three translations going from left to right, uh, front to back, and down to up. And also the rotation, so side to side, up and down, and that. Also called roll pitch. Yeah, I forget which one corresponds to, to which rotation. But they will output graphs like these. Notice that the scale on the left, it is auto-scaled for each one, so just be aware of that. Um, it's always a question about what is the threshold for whether I should remove a volume that had too much motion. Let's say, you know, from this one to this one, there was a pretty steep jump. Right? Is that enough to remove it? In this case, I mean, this scale is on 0 0.25 to negative 0.35. Probably doesn't matter that much. The rules of thumb that I've seen, and take this with a grain of salt, is if there was sudden motion of, let's see here, I think half a voxel size. So let's say your voxel acquisition was two by two by two, and they moved a millimeter or more from one volume to another. You know, maybe you want to consider either censoring that volume, or if you have enough power, maybe even remove that run altogether. The reason being, you know, if if you do have these pretty severe changes in motion it's not likely that it's only in one direction, right? They could be moving and also rotating a little bit. We're assuming that these are just in, you know, basically linear directions, right? And those assumptions fall if, you know, they're, they're combinations of these and they're at different velocities at different parts of when they're moving, which is why they usually recommend including the derivatives of all these motion parameters to account for those, those nonlinearities. Okay. If they move over the course of the entire run by, say, a voxel or more, some people recommend uh, throwing out the entire scan. Again, it depends. It depends on, are you looking at a clinical population? Are you scanning children? Maybe you just, you need more data, children move more, and you need to have a slightly more lenient threshold. I'm just giving you some guidelines. There's no hard and fast rules because, again, you know, it, it's, it's hard to compress all of this information to, say, a single number. Although they do try to do it with things like frame-wise displacement and something called DVARs. That's more an SPM package. I'm not going to talk about that. But there are ways that they try to, you know, combine everything into a single number. Whether it works, uh, I'm still on the fence about it. Just my personal... Preference. This is my personal preference. You do have options to censor time points that have too much motion, which AFNI will do for you. Basically, it removes it, acts like it didn't happen, right? Um, which is a way to approach it. Uh, you can also try to interpolate between uh, time points that have way too much motion. You know, say, like, remove it, and then try to interpolate what the signal is like between those two. Problems with that are that cosmetically it can seem to improve your data, but actually the, the fixed data points share more of the characteristics with the noise in the data set as opposed to the signal. I think it was Jonathan Power who, who pointed that out. So basically there's no free lunch. I always tell people motion is something that you should deal with before you scan. So train them on a mock scanner. Get them familiar with the environment. Try not to make your task too tedious or 
too shocking or too boring. Anything like, no, serious. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I've, I, I've, I use actual shocks in my <laughs> So have I, so. <laughs> I tested it out. What kind of shocker do you use? Shocker? Sh yeah, shock uh, delivery. Uh, Scilab system, like an SHK. Like okay. School. Okay. Yeah, we use something. I mean, they do the same thing. But, yeah. Um, it only goes up to is it mill amps? Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story about that later. It's not for the group. Uh, <laughs> I was testing it out on myself. That's the setup. Uh, yeah. And it can actually go higher than five mill amps if you yeah. program it a certain way. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're getting me. I'll, uh, I'll so, um, yeah. So can you give? Let's say like you have. A lot of movement, parsement moving a lot. Can you say that using the techniques, you can get up to like ninety percent of accuracy of the original data? Like okay, so how much of the yeah. actual original signal can you right. recover? I haven't seen a, a paper showing that definitively, um, so I, I can't say for sure. I mean, the the most recommended practices these days seem to be including derivatives of motion. That seems to to clean up the data quite a bit. So when I say clean up the data, if there's an effect that you know is is there, and without motion correction you're seeing artifacts like signal around the edges of the brain or in non-brain areas, it it seems to eliminate that and strengthen the uh, the true signal that we we know should be there, like a motor task or a really simple cognitive task. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's better not to have any movement. It's best not to have any movement. I mean, the, the more that you can train the subject and make them comfortable, that just removes so many of these problems. Because no matter what we do, y you're, you're messing with the data quite a bit. So I just prefer just to try to make them comfortable. Okay, a few more steps here. Uh, so registration is going to align your anatomical and functional images. So the contrast between gray and white matter is essentially flipped. And registration algorithms use that information to match them up and then align both of those to a template. So normalization, it standardizes all the voxel sizes, usually the two by two by two, and also the image dimensions on X, Y, and Z. Obviously this allows for comparison then across studies, the main reason that we do normalization. And one of the main uh, template images that we align to is something called uh, Montreal Neurological Institute, or MNI. <coughs> it's an average of 152 brains, and they're all in standardized space. Different, there are many, many different templates out there, actually. Uh, Tallyrack, Tallyrack Turno Atlas. That's falling out of favor. I would, I would strongly recommend not using it, although it is an option in AFNI. They still include it. Which is why sometimes you see these uh, .tl or plus TLRC extensions in the data, which we'll, we'll see in a little bit. Uh, that's legacy. Okay, so even if your data is an MNI space, it'll still have a plus TL, TLRC extension. So just keep that in mind. Unfortunately, they just can't fix that without affecting a bunch of other stuff. Okay. So normalization, we have our template image, right? So say this is a MNI brain, it's an MNI space. Uh, and we have our individual subject anatomical image. So when we try to normalize these, and the same thing happens in registration too, we have translations where it can move slightly to try to best align it. We have rotations, which we can turn it one way, turn it the other way, again, in all three dimensions. We can zoom it, or we either expand the entire brain or shrink it. And we also have shears, which if I took the corners of the brain and then pulled them that way, like elongating a, a, a square into a parallelogram. So we do all those to try to uh, align these two brains. 
We call these the 12 degrees of freedom. There's three translations, three rotations, three zooms, and three shears. Now, this aligns the size and the position of the brains, but not necessarily the shape of the internal structures. It's a very important thing to keep in mind. Now, you can try to get a better fit with something called nonlinear transformations. That went by way too quick. Sorry about that. Let me bring that back up. So these are better at matching the, the individual shapes of, say, the gyri, sulci, subcortical areas. And the important thing about nonlinear transformations is you don't need to uh, preserve the relationship between all the different points of the image like you do in a linear transformation. What that means, if, if I say do uh, a linear transformation where I zoom the brain to make it a little bit bigger, everything has to increase by the same degree. Like every voxel increases a little bit or shrinks a little bit. If I'm doing a nonlinear transformation, it's almost like, think about like squeezing a sponge, right? So I can kind of squeeze it down here, kind of make it get bigger up here. It's not as though every part of the entire image has the same uh, spatial transformation applied to it, okay? So it can be better for both uh, registration, normalization. The cost is computational. I think that's being a little bit more tractable because our computers are faster. But also with nonlinear transformations, there's more opportunities for things to go wrong. You basically, you, so instead of 12 degrees of freedom, you have many, many more degrees of freedom. There's not really an upper bound on the amount of things that you can change. But you can get into this uh, weird thing called a, a local, local minimum. I wonder if I should even go into this. Basically, when you're, you're trying to minimize something called a cost function between a reference image, so something that's you know, staying stationary, and your source image. So say this is my template, this is my subject, I'm trying to you know, align the two. And I may get to one point where it seems to minimize the cost or the discrepancy between the two, and it says that's good enough, and it stops. But you look at it and it's at a weird angle or something because it got stuck at a certain view and it didn't really get out of that. Like you got into a valley and you said this is the lowest point, but if I went up another ridge, I would get into an even deeper valley, right? And that can happen. It can happen with linear transformations as well, but be especially careful about that with nonlinear transformations. Okay, lastly, smoothing. Pretty simple idea. At each voxel in the brain, we take the average of that voxel and its neighbors, and then we replace the intensity of that voxel with that neighbor average. So simple concept, it happens at each part of the brain, each voxel simultaneously. The reasons for this is if there actually is signal in say, you know, this part of the brain, that's going to increase the signal and it's going to decrease noise because the noise should be random fluctuations and should all get averaged out. Right. The, uh, some of the drawbacks are you could be averaging, say, if you're at a border of some place, you could be averaging across non-brain areas, and that's, that's no good, even if it is you know, random noise. Um, you also lose spatial specificity. So if you're really interested in a very specific part of the brain, like, say, Broca's area, this is relatively small, or the amygdala, some subcortical structure, which is pretty small, you'll need to lower your smoothing threshold to make sure that you're not averaging signal from like a completely unrelated functional area. And it's not always clear what that limit is. Could you use a mask so that uh, it doesn't average with outside of the brain? Yes, so can you use a mask to restrict where you smooth? Yes, absolutely. Um, that's an individual acne band. I don't know if we're going to be able to get to it. Very useful. It's called 3D Blur in Mask. 3D Blur in Mask. So you can give it, say, a gray matter mask, and it's not going to average anything from the white matter or outside the brain or any of the ventricles. It's a very, very useful tool. 3D Blur in Mask is the command. What smoothing do you recommend? What smoothing do I recommend? It entirely depends on your study. If I'm interested in a really big part of the brain, 
like a relatively big part, like the say the singlet area, dorsal singlet, or FF, FFA. No, not FFA. Uh, pre SMA, something like that. I'd use a relatively big smoothing kernel, like seven, eight millimeters. Um, default in AFNI is four. I think that's a little on the small side, but it depends. It really depends on what you're looking at. If I'm looking at Broca's area, to give that example again, something like eight millimeters, probably too big. The problem is, it's going to be applying this across all parts of the brain at the same time. We could theoretically apply different smoothing kernels in different parts of the brain or even for each voxel, but that becomes a lot more difficult and much more computationally intensive, unfortunately. I was just going to ask, but if you're an idiot, you want to look at the individual Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, so if you want to look at two very different parts of the brain, which probably require different smoothing parameters, I don't have an easy answer for you, unfortunately. Is anybody going to the AFNI boot camp, by the way? We got a few. Ask them, please. <laughs> then let me know, and I'll blog about it. Not gonna care. <laughs> oh, is there a question about adherence smoothness? Oh, I was yeah, I was gonna say just it also okay. Right, yeah, you're opening up a, a can of words. Um, something else they don't tell you. I didn't or this until after a few years of doing imaging analysis, is the images off the scanner have some inherent smoothness already built into it, just as a function of how, how these images are being collected, right? There's, there's some, obviously there's some spatial correlation between adjacent voxels, right? It's not the, the case that they're, each voxel is completely independent from every other voxel in the brain. It's just, it's just not true. So there is some inherent smoothing, and AFNI will try to estimate that. So whatever the smoothing kernel is that you propose to use, like 4 millimeters, 8 millimeters, be aware that that inherent smoothness gets added on top of that. Very important, because tomorrow we'll be talking about how to accurately estimate the smoothness in your images using something called... I wasn't ready for my mic drop yet. <laughs> using... using Yes, I'm just kidding. Using something called a 3D full with half max. Right? I'll leave that more for tomorrow because that gets into this Equin paper, which I wanted to, to, to talk about. Or maybe that was during group analysis today. But so be aware, smoothing is is a very important issue. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. Do any of the pre processing commands, like the ones that before smoothing, introduce? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say smoothness so much as they, there is some spatial interpolation. Um, how that translates into smoothness, like if you do motion correction, you do quite a bit of motion correction. You need to do a lot of motion correction to, to, to rectify the image. Um, how does that translate into smoothness? I'm sure it does to some degree, but I don't know how much. Like if you had to correct for a motion, for a millimeter of motion, how much... Spatial interpolation is that? I don't know because I don't know the ins and outs of what's going on, but it, it does affect it for sure. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions before we go on? Real quick about the registration. Yeah. So sometimes when using things like 2D linear or whatever, like yeah. we get some, like with our functional to structural, we get, for lack of a better term, like dorsal. Mohawking um, oh, almost man. every time uh, really? okay. with their data. I mean, to what extent do you recommend, if any recommendation, like correcting for things like that, or those things usually figured out a little bit, uh, factored in with the normalization step, anything like that? I'd have to see what exactly uh, you're talking about. Um, something that I will point out during the practical is if. Uh, If your functional and your structural start off very far from each other, you do need to account for that something with something called a, either auto-align or you do, yeah, yeah, a, a line center or something called, there's another way to do it. It's like a, a giant move option, which I think might call upon that same algorithm. But whenever I've had problems 
uh, maybe not exactly what you're describing, but any problems with registration or normalization, that usually fixes it. So beyond that, um, there are some other parameters you can change. There are other cost functions you can use. But uh, I, again, I just need to see exactly what you're talking about. That sounds very interesting. Mohawking? I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> okay. I mean, like, everything's aligned more, okay. mostly. But yeah, it's just, I wasn't sure if normalization corrects for some of those things. Okay. My sense is probably not. Maybe a little, but it'll still be introduced somehow. Um, if you can bring it tomorrow, I'd be happy to look at it. Um... I'm going to skip over temporal filtering. Basically, we have we can have very long, slow signal drifts over time, either from the scanner or things like breathing. Uh, and essentially, we just try to filter those out before we recombine the signal. So we can decompose it into a bunch of these different sine waves. Um, we can eliminate ones below a certain cutoff. So if there's uh, like a very slow one, like say sine one, for example, we can delete that, reconstruct the entire image, and then reconstruct uh, the time series. Okay, I really want to get to the practical, but a few things here. Here's what you're going to see in, uh, in one of the data sets after we pre-process it. So APNE has its own format, it has brickhead format. Um, it can read something called nifty format, which is the default that can be read by every software package. So if you're new to neural imaging, there's a format called nifty. It has a .nii extension. Just know that that can be read by anything. And AFNI can read it as well. But if you don't specifically tell it to output a nifty format, it's going to output it in brick head format. So something like this, pb00 sub 01 r one tcat um, So this is the name. Of the data set, it gets formatted to tell you which run it was, what was applied to it. This plus a rig is the view. So a rig means original space. It hasn't been transformed or normalized. Once they get transformed, you'll see this uh, TLRC extension, regardless of whether you normalize to a Telerac or MNI brain. And then say these two refer to the same data set. Brick is the raw data, head is the header that points towards where certain information in the raw data is stored. Nifty, it's all combined, so it's just one image. Yeah? Uh, how do you transform from Brick to Nifty? How do you transform from Brick to, to Nifty? To Nifty? There are a few commands. There's 3D AFNI to Nifty. And I, I can show you how to do that. In the demo, there's also 3D copy. And all you do for the output, you just specify a .nii extension, and it will automatically convert it. OK, during the practical, here's what a typical API command looks like. So you have the actual API command, let's say 3D merge, which in this case can perform smoothing. You give it some options, which have these things called flags, so these hyphens in front of it. So in this case, something like one blur underscore FWHM stands for full half max 4.0. What do you think that option does, given what we just talked about? Mm -hmm. Smooths by four millimeters, a four millimeter smooth increment. Yeah. Um, a few other options. Then usually there's always, especially if it's creating something new, not just overwriting uh, header information for the current data set, this prefix part always shows up. Why is it called prefix? I don't know, but I guess because you can specify a prefix if you want to. But you just specify what the name of the output file is. And then typically, the very last thing that you'll be entering is the input into the command. Okay, This is like learning a different language if you haven't used AFNI before. It's kind of like, you know, switching from English to Spanish, where sometimes, you know, subject for object can be a little... Well, according to us, we think it's all flipped around. But other people are like, no, it's actually the other way. But it's almost as though um, input, we'd expect it to maybe come first, but usually it comes at the very end. So we 
talk about everything we want to do to it. We say what we want to call the output, and then we give it the actual input. We'll be seeing this quite a bit in the next couple days. You'll be getting more fluent with it. Um, don't worry about these dollar signs that refer to variables. We'll cover that in, in scripting. Sometimes uh, with a command like 3 delineate, you give a source image and a master image. You see this a lot with resampling data sets. So anytime we have two data sets where one has, say, voxel size of 3 by 3 by 3, other one has voxel size 2 by 2 by 2, if I want to use one with the other, right? Let's say I want to apply this image as a mask to restrict my analysis. I need to make sure that they're in the same space and they have the same voxel dimensions. So in that case, you'll see this quite a bit where the master flag specifies what you're resampling to. Like what remains stationary, what don't we mess around with and interpolate. And then the source image is what we need to move around and actually resample to get to be in the same dimensions. This comes up more when we talk about uh, ROI analysis. But it also happens during registration. Okay. Swear to God, I'm almost done. We'll have about 45 minutes for the practical. Um, one of the first commands I want to have you do is something called 3D info. All right, so any data set that you have um, is composed of something called sub-bricks, is AFNI jargon. Okay. Other uh, packages like SPM, FSL, they call them frames. But think about it like this. When I, when I show you that initial image with that giant Rubik's Cube, right, and I said we daisy chain all those things together, that is that maps on to individual sub-bricks. So if I had an entire time series where I had you know, first volume, second volume, third volume, and so on, let's say 100 volumes, I would have 100 sub-bricks in that AFNI data set. So it's one data set, but 100 sub-bricks. Now, that's not only time series. When we create things like statistical data sets, you'll see later this afternoon, you'll, be, you'll have a single data set with sub-bricks, but it's not a time series necessarily. It's just containing different statistical maps in the same statistical data set. There's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of new words. You know, I, I do apologize because we are compressing a lot today. But I'm hoping that as I'm saying a lot of this and as you're using a lot of it, you'll start to become more fluent with it. It's not going to, if you're completely new to this, please do not. If you feel overwhelmed, that's totally normal. We've only been talking about this for a very short time. But I, I do promise if you keep practicing with this <coughs> and you pay attention and you subscribe to my YouTube channel <laughs> and you click on the ads and you donate, you will understand it. No, there's no, there's no donation. I had a donation very early on button and I think I made like 30 bucks over a couple of years. I was very appreciative. Uh, somebody sent me a Starbucks gift card and... Um, I was very happy about that. Okay. I really, I already went over this, but the last thing uh, about all this header information, so you, in addition to these sub-bricks, you, you see things like the voxel resolution, right? So 3 by 3 by 3 in this case. Um, you see in millimeters what the extents are, so this is called the field of view. Right? This is the acquisition from, from the scanner. And you can change this by doing resampling as well. So this is a data set that's been resampled, I believe, to a, a standardized space. This is going to be important mostly later, uh, the second day when we talk about ROI analysis. But AFNI's default view is something called radiological orientation, okay, RAI. That means that... Uh, left is going to be on your right, and right is going to be on your left. Almost as though, let me make sure I got this right, almost as though you're looking at my brain from my feet upwards. Does that make sense? So if you kind of like, if you like remove everything below here and you just see my brain from, from the bottom. 
Okay, my right would be on your left, my left would be on your right. Okay, the other convention is called neurological orientation. That's the opposite. It's a little bit more intuitive. It's like I'm looking at the brain from the, the top, like a neurologist would do when they're operating on it. So their left is on my left, their right is on my right. right? The default in apnea is radiological. That becomes important whenever you're doing any kind of uh, resampling or creating an ROI from, say, a sphere. Be aware of that I this is really annoying to me because <laughs> neurological orientation makes a lot more sense. You, I believe you can change that default through the AFNI startup script, but that's a little bit more advanced. We won't cover that, so just 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 be aware of that. Okay, so we are all in that. Uh, just make sure that you're on this in the. The, the home directory where the, the data is, right? Okay. All right. Um, so I'm doing this on my machine. Can everybody see this okay? Is this color scheme? I can change it during the break if this is, stings the eye too much. Okay, all right, uh, but you should see something roughly like this. I may have a couple other extra things in there, but you should see the subjects, yeah? Uh, so if you see a uh, CD to flanker, the fl <coughs> flanker directory. So CD space in the flanker directory, and uh, hit enter. Okay, and if you type LS, you should see the individual subject directories. You should be okay for now. We can talk over lunch. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, everybody has 26 yeah. subjects. We have one person who has only 17 for some reason. Okay. Uh, all right. So follow along. So we type CD. We're going to look at the first subject right now. Go into there, CD sub 01, and then type LS. You'll be doing this a lot, so as soon as you change directory into a new place, type LS just to see what's in there. It'll, it'll become a habit eventually. Okay, you should see only a mat and funk, right? Okay, so first let's go into a nat, type LS. Notice just by default, what was downloaded, this thing is in nifty format. It also has this GZ extension, meaning it was gzipped. It's like regular zipping in Windows. It's been compressed. But regardless, AFNI can read it. So if you type AFNI from that directory, it should automatically load that, that subject's image. Yeah? This is the AFNI graphical user interface, all right? This thing's kind of crazy. I'm not going to lie. It's not intuitive at all to start out with. But first thing, notice that you have three orthogonal images images that open up. You have axial, you have sagittal, you have coronal. You see this repeatedly. And you see things like the coordinates of the crosshair point. Don't worry too much about that. Um, you can manipulate things like the crosshairs. You can turn them off. You can... Just see some different options, change the color, modify this however you want. Defaults are fine, so I'm not going to mess with them too much. But the main thing about these anatomical images, you know, just select one of these. You can expand it by clicking and dragging on this right window pane here. And if you start using the arrow keys, right, you can manipulate where this crosshair is. And also notice that as you're moving that crosshair, you will move through uh, different parts of the other images. So you can see that coronal, or sorry, that axial section is being looked through. Now, I always look at this, I give a pretty thorough 
look through for this after I first uh, get a subject. One, make sure that there weren't any major motion artifacts in the anatomical image, and also to check for possible uh, artifacts. I'm not just talking about things like were they wearing a retainer that led to signal loss. Uh, did they have maybe a, uh, a hemorrhage or something that looks kind of weird? I have found them. Mm -hmm. It's very, very rare because I usually scan you know, healthy controls, but I do look at them. To make it easier, if you press V, you go into video mode. Ah. What? Well, it's just really annoying that you can't like drag around. <laughs> I know, I know, yeah, you, you, you can't try to run. That is annoying. Well, with video mode, you can go through a lot of the slices simultaneously or consecutively very quickly. Yeah? Is there a command to print like screenshots of a lot of the slices so that you can check yes. rapidly? Yes. So if you want to look at a bunch of slices uh, at the same time, let's see here. If you click on montage, let's say I want to get three by three image, something like that. It's at the very bottom. Mont, M-O-N-T. So down here, montage, you can specify what you want the script to look like, and we'll create many different slices simultaneously. Could you do it through the command line? Uh, you could, but I don't know yeah, what the exact command is. How can I stop the... Oh, pr oh press space bar to stop the video mode. Yeah. Okay, we're all good with that? The next thing I want to show you is the time series. Now, if we looked, if we try to look at the time series with an anatomical image, you look at the time series by clicking on graph, right? But there's nothing there because the anatomical image doesn't have a time dimension. It's just one image taken at one time, right? So we're going to start looking at some of the functional data. So X out of your viewer. Let's click on, the, on that main console, the red X in the top left. So the very top left. Should get out of it. Yeah. All right. And then you're back at the command line, type cd dot dot to represent going up one directory. cd dot dot. You're back in that directory for nat and func. Go into the func directory. And then type ls. Now what you should see is the old images, the runs, and also... Uh, the events which are the timing files. Now, one command we're going to run from the command line, which you will run over and over again, 3D info, just type sub and then hit tab. Now it's going to fill up everything that is common to everything that fits that. So it's going to go up to run dash. Now it could be one or two, so let's just say one. Just type a one, then another tab. Oh, sorry. Uh, bold. Yeah. 3D info, sub one, task, blanker, one, one, bold. Okay, so we're going to do 3D. Do you think you can make it a bit smaller to your terminal? Yeah, sure. No. Oh. oh. Sorry, one second. Yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, I see what you're saying. So I can still have the text big, but just bring it up like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anybody still having problems with that? Okay. So if you hit return with that, you get quite a bit of output. Sorry, let me. Sorry, what? Yeah, this is the command that we ran right here, and then we caught quite a bit of output down here. Yeah. Now, it gives you a lot of information about, you know, when was this created, what's the template space, also known as the view space. The main things I always look for 
are the field of view, so R to L extent, A to P, I to S, and that gives you the extent in millimeters across each of those directions. And so it's going from negative 93 millimeters to the right and 95 millimeters to the left. In other words, if zero is, you know, let's say close to the midpoint, in our AI orientation, this is counterintuitive, anything to the right of that is negative and anything to the left is positive. Makes more sense to me if it's, you know, negative here, then it gets more positive as you go to the right. In AFNI, that's flipped around. And then this is the resolution in the x, y, z directions. So apparently this was acquired with resolution of 3 by 3 by 4. And there's 64 voxels in the x direction, 64 in the y direction, and 40 in the z direction. Z is going from bottom to top. All right, so x left to right, y back to front, and z is from bottom to top. Now type AFNI, hit return, see some stuff. And again, we have the same options available to us as we did when looking at the anatomical image. You can change the montage, you can change the crosshairs, everything is still the same. But the important additional feature that we get when we look at a functional image with the AFNI viewer is we can look at the time series. Yeah, who said that? Yeah, I like that. I like that attitude. So if you click on graph, here's that really weird signal that we that we saw before, right? So we know that they were doing a task during this. We also know that there's a lot of noise. So this is going to look like a very jagged, messy signal. And our job is to try to decompose this into what the actual response was to each individual condition, which we'll do this afternoon. Um, some shortcuts you can do to make this look a little bit cleaner. So from this middle square, type M and then type M again to magnify into it. And then press A to auto scale, which, which may not change it. It may not already be scaled correctly. But this is one of the first pre-processing checks that we do. Right? Remember when I talked about whether we remove the first however many TRs? Okay. If it were the case that uh, we had some TRs or you know, volumes which had not reached equi equilibrium yet, which hadn't you know, decreased into a steady steady state, you would see a really sharp jump and it would look like an entirely, like those first few volumes were on an entirely different scale than this one. Okay, I don't have an example of what that looks like, but you would see like a really huge spike up there and then it would come way down and then you would have all of this. Now, we don't see any of that here. That suggests to me that those volumes were already discarded by the scanner, which is common. But I would still, I would still have this as a typical sanity check. The next check that we're going to do is checking for motion across this entire thing. So remember, we had a video mode before. Yeah? Video mode in this is going to be uh, running through each volume at a pretty, pretty quick clip. What I prefer to do to check whether there are any motion artifacts that I should really be aware of is to select a voxel near the edge of the brain. Let's say right there. Okay, You can select anything. I just like to select something that usually uh, around the top of the brain, right at the, right at the edge. Now, why do I do that? Anybody have any idea why I would select something at the very edge if I wanted to, to eyeball yeah, it should be easier to see because if there is going to be a sharp change in motion, right, that voxel might move out of the field of view and you see like a huge change in the signal. That's why it's just more apparent there. So if you have a voxel you're selected with, you're happy with, just click on V. Oh, sorry. First you need to highlight one of the, uh, the view panes. Oops. Or just have your cursor over it. Sorry, one second, one second, one second. What am I doing here? I lied to you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, go back to a box that you're happy with. Click in here. Let's go to time point one. And then press V. Okay, there we go. So a couple of things I'm looking for. Um, even before I started the movie mode, 
if there was a really, really big spike that seemed very out of place. There are going to be some you know, peaks and valleys that probably correspond to actual signal change, right? And that's fine. We, we, we don't want to remove that. But I'm looking at this in conjunction with this to see whether, you know, when there's any huge change, do I see the brain also moving quite a bit? Okay. So this is just like a kind of a basic quality assurance check. And also, you may see huge spikes in a signal that aren't due to your task, but they could be due to something like a scanner spike. Okay. Those are also typical, and that might may be something that you need to remove uh, manually. Right? It's not going to be detected by the actual motion correction algorithm because it wasn't due to motion, it was due to a spike. Those are more rare, but you should still try to identify those. And in that case, it would, it would be obvious uh, because the entire brain would seem to get brighter all of a sudden and then go back to some kind of baseline. Okay, so brief exercise, what I want you to do, just do this on your own, but we're going to go to underlay and choose the second run. We'll get to overlay in the next lecture. But for now, sorry, everybody there? Just click on underlay on this button right here. Uh, either one is fine. Apply or set should be fine. I, I simply, if you double click on it, usually that's fine. Or you just highlight it, click set, and you're fine. The only difference is set will exit out of the window. It'll apply it and then exit. Apply it actually changes it, but it leaves the window open. But almost always I just click on set. Okay, so... All I want you to do for the next few minutes is you know, click around, mess around with the montage, mess around with crosshairs, color the crosshairs, whatever, I don't care. Look at, look at some, different, some different time series from different people. Okay, if I give your attention briefly, uh, Salah brought up a good point. Remember at the very beginning, I pressed M a couple times to zoom in on just one voxel. If you want a better sense of what's going on, hold down Shift, press M, uh, so select this window. Hold Shift, press M, and notice it adds another group of voxels that I can look at simultaneously. And also notice that this window here shows you which ones are actually being selected. And so now this is a, a four by four matrix, and we can see quite a bit more information here. Okay, how are we doing so far? Are we so getting a little comfortable with it? Because you obviously have a lot of signals here. Usually it's better to just look at the edges of the brain. I like to look at the edges. Yeah, and then if there's like a really huge um, jump in the signal, then yeah. you would consider it's a huge jump. Yeah. 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 What well, we'll see later, um, the default apnea preprocessing will uh, it'll show you which ones are marked as problems. Like it, it has its own default threshold built in, which we can change if we want to for what motion it will, it's going to remove. And you can do this review at the very end of all your pre-processing, and it'll show you, uh, like, um, it'll show you those motion parameters we looked at before, and it will like have a red line of anything above this we 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 marked as a problem volume and we removed it. Yeah, but we'll we'll see that in uh, first level analysis. <laughs> okay, any questions so far? These are the very basics of, you know, just like a couple of the commands and couple of the other things. Okay, next, we're going to wrap up in five minutes because we don't want this to get too cold. We'll just uh, add that time into the, into the afternoon. Okay, but no questions so far? Okay, I'm not that good of a teacher. There's got to be some questions. Okay, um, so type cd dot dot. Oops. Again, I always type ls unless I, I'm very familiar with what's in the environment. And then type cd on that. And then, okay, so we have a good friend, the sub 01 T1 weighted image. We're going to do one of the skull stripping uh, 
methods manually. And then we're going to copy one of the preprocessing scripts into this subject directory. We're going to let the whole thing run while we eat our pizza, and then we'll see all that preprocessed stuff when we come back. Sound good? Okay. I'm just as hungry as you are. So to, to strip this skull, uh, to show you another command besides 3info that we may come into contact quite a bit, so it's called 3D skull strip. The S's are capitalized, by the way. Now, if I want to see what the help is for a command, I simply hit return to return the... Oh, this is one that doesn't do that. Um, wah, wah, yeah, yeah. If I type 3 info and, and hit return, I would get all the, the help command, right? Uh, 3D skull strip is pretty old. So I think I need to give it the help flag to actually see what the help is. Okay. So you get a lot of information. We'll, I'll show you later how you can make this uh, a little bit more manageable. But if you scroll up, uh, man, there's a lot of stuff here. I'm just trying to get to the basics. Usually they have the basic options that are required at the very uh, beginning of it. So there's a ton of stuff. There are a ton of options, a ton of fine control you can have over it, and these help files are excellent. I think it's the best documented um, software. Okay, I'm, here we go, here we go, finally. So at the very beginning of this help, you would see something like, okay, 3D skull strip, dash input, and then whatever the data set is. We can also give it a prefix to, to show what the output is. But this is slightly different from that other command template I showed you where the input is at the very end. So just scroll to the very bottom. Back to our terminal, 3D skull strip, and then, was it insets or input? Input, wow. Okay, I've been doing this for years, still can't remember. Input, and then sub, just type sub, hit tab, and you'll get this as an input. Okay, now it's up to you. You can just hit enter, or you can type dash prefix and call it whatever output you want. If you don't give it anything, I believe it appends something to the end of this, maybe ns or something, or stripped. I forget what exactly. Just telling you that it's actually a stripped image. I'm going to do it without anything. Do you think this one is better than SSL is called a strip in your opinion? Do I think it's better? Then FSL's uh, bet. I'm going to go on record and say, yeah, I like it better. Um, you know, it's not the only option available to you. There's something out of UCLA. Uh, what's his name? Martin. Martin something, I forget. But he he's created his own skull stripping thing, and it seems to be superior to all of them. Mm -hmm. But... Is there any articles that compares all of them, or that has been told? Um, maybe Martin did, actually, now that I think about it. Yeah, so the question was, you know, across all these different ways to skull strip, all the skull strip packages, is there one that is superior to the other? Just so you know, this takes a little bit of time. Um, I haven't seen a systematic comparison, but just in my experience, I think 3D skull strip does pretty well. Come on, hurry up. We're hungry. <laughs> I didn't think it was going to take this song. Ah, skull surfing. Come on. Let me know when yours finishes because maybe your computers are. No, it just keeps going. Thank you. Completely misremembered. Okay. I'll give it 10 more seconds. If it doesn't finish, we'll just go on to executing the actual preprocessing script and then we'll. Oh! <laughs> you just gotta threaten it. Okay.
Uh, all right. So it gives you, don't pay attention to what that output says so far, just hit AFNI. And then it's going to automatically load that skull stripped image, right? So the main thing I check are the edges of the brain with my viewer. Seems to do pretty well. If I want uh, to get a good sense of how much skull it removed, I click overlay. Um, I load that original sub-01 T1 weighted image. Don't pay attention to this extra stuff I have in here. We'll, we'll get to how to do that uh, in the afternoon. So I just double click on it to, to set it, or you can just click set. So this looks kind of weird, right? Like how, what, how do we interpret this? Uh, so highlight your image viewer. So I just clicked in here and press O. Okay, so the overlay has been removed. Now if I press U, it's going to toggle between both of these images that are, that are loaded in memory, right? U. Yeah, U. That means toggle the underlay. And if I press it here, here, I can get a really good sense of what parts of the skull were removed, right? Can you say again, O to disappear the overlay, yeah. and then... Yeah, press O to make the overlay disappear, and then press U to toggle between the two images. This is going to be also really important for looking at registration. We're going to be looking at the alignment between individual structures. Okay. Press U. Yeah, so just highlight the actual screen, press U. Yeah. So remember, first press O, remove the underlay, or remove the overlay, then press U. Okay, everything good in this corner? We good? What's it? What? How did that happen? That's okay for now. For now, don't we? Oh, uh, it's really weird. You don't have permissions? Yeah. Hmm. Did you have the same? Okay, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Don't worry too much about it. Okay, we're all good so far. Just want to get through this last part, then we'll we'll eat. Okay. All right. If you can hear me clap once, you can hear me clap twice. Can hear me clap three times. No, okay. It's a joke. I'm like, no applause, please. Okay. Uh, the last thing we're going to do is run the pre-processing script. Okay. So this this includes everything we've done like with the skull stripping. It also does motion correction, a bunch of other stuff. And this is really the moment of truth to see whether this is going to work on your machine. So type cd dot dot slash dot dot. That's going to take you up two directories. Just make sure you're in this directory that has all the subject directories. <laughs> okay, are we there? Anybody not there? Okay. Now, the other directory that you... Uh, copy to your home directory. That's flanker underscore scripts, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I may not have the exact same paths as you all, but type ls then dot dot. You should see a directory that says flanker underscore scripts, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody not see that? Okay, good. So, um, this is what you're going to type. It's not going to work on my machine, but type cp dot dot slash then is this, is it typed this way? Is it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Just use tab if you want to make sure that you're doing the right one. Then a slash, asterisk, space, and then a dot. So it's going to copy everything in the Flanker scripts directory to your current directory symbolized by a dot. Now press enter. 
Okay, no, no errors? Awesome. Okay, so now type ls again, and you should see some scripts like with this .sh extension, and also an MNI AVG 152T1. Does everybody see that? Does anybody not see that? Okay, great. All right. So, uh, don't copy what I'm doing right now. I'm just getting everything set up. Okay, so we're still we're in this original directory. Um, type cp proc underscore flanker. Use tab just to make sure you have the right one, and then sub o one, and hit return. Are you still having that permission? Okay, I'll get to that um, during the break. So that copies the proc flanker script into sub 01. Now type cd sub dash 01. Type ls, you should see this, yeah? So proc flanker is in, in this particular directory. <clears throat> now type tcsh dot dot. Uh, let's see here. Okay, a little bit of a head fake. Just type cd dot dot. I want to make sure this works correctly. tcsh make underscore timings dot sh. This is going to be more clear in the second half why we did this. And then press enter. Good. No errors. It's thinking a little bit, yeah? No errors. Awesome. Okay. Now type cd sub 01. That's just... Um, I get into this in a little bit, but that's just to make sure that the timings are where they should be, because this is actually going to run through the model too. I just combined everything, and then we'll pick it apart later. Okay, so I have all of this. Type tcsh space proc flanker, and then sub o one. Don't press enter yet. Okay, press enter. I just want to make sure it worked on mine. Okay, it's doing stuff, right? It's not giving you an error. Does anybody get an error? Okay, you, so... I just spelled it wrong. Nobody else had any problems, though? Let's see. Okay, we're going to come back to this later. Thank you so much for, for sticking with this, but this is critical that this thing worked. Like, oh my god. <laughs> So, so happy. Okay. Is it possible uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, one second. One second.